A young apothecary out in the city visits a shopkeeper. The shopkeeper has a new problem on hand. A battered elf who's been viciously abused has been dumped on him. Obviously, he doesn't want to keep her since she's useless to him. Moreover, she isn't a discarded item like the rest of the things he sells. She is a living person who needs to be fed. Who has time to feed an elf anyway? He tells the apothecary about her, making her seem useful by trying to appeal to his medicinal trade. Apparently, the elf can be chopped up and used in drugs. He can make a lot of profit by cutting up this ragged elf who is good for nothing else. Well, that's not the humane thing to do to anyone, but who are we to judge? The apothecary inspects her more closely. She's in a much worse condition than he thought. Can she even hear or see him? Apparently she can't. She has lost vision in both of her eyes and has physically lost one of her eyes. The rest of her physical condition was by no means any better, with whip marks on her body and most of her nails being ripped off. Although, her hearing seems to be intact. What kind of a demon would torture this poor elf? The apothecary can't turn a blind eye to her. His medicinal trade and humanity refuse to let him go on his way like he hasn't seen anything. If he refuses to protect her and treat her, more dangers may descend upon her in the future. She might be bought and sold countless times, and abused in a way that can end up killing or maiming her. His inner dilemma is apparent on his face when he thinks through his decision. He doesn't have time to sleep on it either. He has to do something this instant. How much extra space will a tiny ragged elf like her take anyway? He lives alone, so he has a lot of space for the elf at his home. The elf starts mumbling something, which he can't make out. She must have forgotten how to form sentences or words, and only remembers how to scream when someone is doing horrible things to her. Her faint whispers indicate that she's mouthing the words go and home. So she has a home too. Where is it? Maybe a thousand miles away, or maybe she doesn't even remember where her home used to be. The shopkeeper gets restless. He wants to make the deal now, as if this elf was no better than any other object in his shop. That's why his asking price for her is no more than what he would have asked for selling livestock. This is a further indication for the apothecary that the elf isn't going to be treated well wherever she goes, as no one will look at her as a breathing person, but just as a means to an end. The young apothecary isn't going to let him pawn her off to another monster who can abuse her. With a determined look in his eyes, the apothecary tells the heartless shopkeeper that he will buy her for a higher price since the parts he wants for his drugs are in pretty good condition. God, which parts is he referring to? However. The fact that he has offered to pay more than what is being asked shows that he has some respect for the elf, and doesn't want her to think that she is worthless. With that said, he tells the shopkeeper to keep this purchase a secret. Of course, he doesn't want the whole city to know that the young apothecary from the nearby village has purchased an elf, even though it can bring a lot of business for him since everyone will want medicines made from an elf's body parts, and of course, he doesn't want that to happen. The shopkeeper is glad to rid himself of the elf. Good for him. He doesn't have to deal with her anymore, and she doesn't matter a bit to him anyway. The apothecary asks for some stuff to make the logistics of getting her to his place easier. The list of things include clean clothes, a belt, some twine, and a wooden pack frame. Does this mean she can't walk? The poor elf is absolutely unresponsive throughout, and doesn't even flinch when he changes her, wraps her with the belt, and takes her away on a wooden pack frame. Apparently, carrying her like property is the only way to keep her safe from the prying eyes of everyone out there. They set out on their journey, not knowing what fate has in store for them. However, the apothecary is sure of one thing, that he has just rescued her, and now he has to save her life as well. The apothecary and the elf duo have covered quite the distance from the city. They left after he had purchased some medicines, and decided that the mountains would be the best route to take to his workshop. They don't want any unexpected run-ins with the monsters that crawl the land. And apparently, he isn't tired after carrying her on his back through such an uneven road. Maybe this is symbolism, to show that the apothecary doesn't mind the heavy burden of the elf, as long as she is secure. After traveling quite a long while, a short stop to rest is necessary, so they hit the brakes on their trek. The apothecary needs to rest his shoulders and every other inch of his body after carrying her for such a long while. But he doesn't mind. As he watches her relax in the middle of nature, the lines on her face may have metaphorically faded, and her features seem a bit calmer, even though her expressions still make her look like she's scared. Scared of what? He doesn't know. But he can guess that she's been bought again and she doesn't know how her new owner is going to treat her. Her confusion is what makes her scared about what fate has planned for her. Moreover, she is an elf. She is no stranger to nature, as all elves live deep in the forest. However, on this mountain road, this elf may have looked magical. The night gathers, and the duo make another stop at the top of the mountain. They can rest here for the night, and continue their journey in the morning. 
The surroundings are much calmer, as there is no one for miles, and they can hear the leaves rustling with the wind. Nature is just too divine, is it not? He cooks dinner for them at the campsite. He feeds her himself, since she can't feed herself. Her limbs don't allow her to move her muscles constantly, and she has to depend on others for simple things, like being fed as well. Her eyes tear up after he feeds her a hot spoonful in a hurry. She might be crying because this is a first for her, someone else feeding a slave like her, and actually caring. Or maybe the food was just too damn hot. The night is long, and the girl develops a fever. She may be overwhelmed and tired, and isn't used to the nightly chill that has overtaken their campsite. Moreover, the apothecary is worried about the rest of her physical condition, since the infection from her wounds may lead to her getting a few limbs amputated. It's not like any of that is her fault. Why does she have to lose limbs? Life has been unfair to her, and he doesn't want to let it happen any longer. His protectiveness for her is a feeling that he has never experienced before either. He prepares a simple antibacterial drink for her, using all of his apothecary knowledge and a few organic ingredients. At least he is well supplied after a visit to the city. He pours the drink into her mouth and waits for it to take effect. She keeps mumbling, however, her breathing becomes calmer. Treatment number one is a success, and he can finally close his eyes and lose himself in a dreamless sleep after such a long and exciting day. He wakes up to find her already awake. He tries to talk to get something out of her except for the mumbles. Of course, he wants her to talk as he wants to know the elf that he has taken charge of. Is she hungry? Is she feeling better? Can she even hear him? Nothing. Not a word comes out of her mouth. They have been together for almost a day, however there hasn't been a single conversation between them. Of course that's not normal. He needs a trigger to make her talk, so he shoots his final shot. He names her Rejure, a name full of hope, a name that signifies his promise of healing her. Still, she remains unresponsive. He has missed his shot. No worries, he has time to make his charm work on her. He wonders if she can understand him, or if she will ever recover well enough to remember her original name. Only time will tell. However, he likes the fact that she isn't a nameless elf anymore. Giving her a name is the first step to make her realize that she deserves something much better than the treatment she has received. For now, they continue their journey on the same road, where he sees the first sign of their destination, and they finally arrive at the village where his workshop is located. This long journey ends, and another longer and harder one begins for them both. The first order of business when they reach the workshop is a bath for the girl. Even though she doesn't smell foul, she can really increase her hygiene game, and the apothecary is going to aid her in this. She must have gone without a bath for months, or maybe years, who knows? He takes off her torn clothes with no reaction from her. Is she a cold-blooded statue, or someone who just doesn't want to feel anymore? She seems to have turned off all the switches of her emotions. Maybe both, because he has seen the scars on her back for the first time, and they are enough to make anyone shiver. There are numerous wounds on her white skin, and all of them are ruthless. How can anyone be that harsh on a tiny, helpless girl like her? No one should go to such an extreme level, even with a person they hate. The apothecary tries to calm himself, thinking about an ointment. However, he can't keep his cool either, which is obvious by his trembling hands while he changes her bandage. He applies the herbal ointment he was thinking about on her wounds, covering them with special leaves so they don't leave any marks behind on her body. Her bandage needs to be changed every three days or so. Hopefully, it will help to heal her external wounds. Her outer wounds can be covered. However, what about the mental scars that she carries with her? What kind of an ointment will make those scars fade away? Suddenly, he remembers he has forgotten to buy some clothes for her. What is he going to cover her up with? A bedsheet? No, that's not good enough. He is the beloved apothecary. He can make use of his friendships. Thus, he decides to visit a friend's house. It is time for him to call on some favors from the good people of the village. However, he doesn't go empty-handed, as he has some gifts in mind. He visits a friend's house and gets old clothes from her for his new patient in exchange for these gifts. It's a fair deal, and both parties are happy. Regere wakes up from her nap as he comes back with the new clothes. He dresses her up, combs her hair like she is a doll. She finally looks like a girl now. If this is the first time for her to be cared for like this, it is also the first time for him as well. Obviously, he doesn't change the clothes and brush the hair of every patient who visits him. Watching her looking much better than he found her, the apothecary realizes how sleep-deprived he has been for the past two days. He has made some progress with her and deserves a few hours of rest. Keeping his immense sleepiness aside, he starts feeding Regere. However, she starts trembling halfway. Is she feeling too cold? Or maybe too hot? What can be the reason? Oh wait, he realizes that she hasn't taken nature's call in two days. 
His obsession with her scars has deprived her of her basic needs. He carries her to the bedroom after dinner and understands her plight of eating liquid foods all the time. But she can't chew solid food because her teeth are in no condition to chew it. He might have to get her some dentures. Additionally, there's always the option of using a high potion, which recovers the body physically but reduces the user's lifespan because of the increased metabolism. He really is a workaholic and takes his duties seriously since he falls asleep while thinking about how to make Regere better. Is his obsession just a scientific curiosity or something more? She lies there with her one eye open as the apothecary snores away. There is no rest for the battered elf anyway. He wakes up and realizes that he passed out last night. He finds her wide awake, sitting in an upright position on the bed. Will he ever manage to wake up before her? He realizes that he has left his field unattended for a couple days. Since he grows his medical ingredients himself, he needs to resume his work on the field. He makes her sit outside so she can enjoy the sun, as if she can even feel enjoyment anymore. He starts working, and after a while starts hearing sobbing sounds. Regere is crying, sobbing silently. He obviously doesn't know the reason behind her tears. How can he? He doesn't know what she's been through. He's a male human, just like her captors, who can't easily help her emotionally. He decides to keep working so that he doesn't make things awkward. It's just too soon for that. He can't go to her and order her to stop her emotions from flowing. Eventually, she stops crying. He works the whole day, until the sun is way down below the horizon. The apothecary reopens his store. He has to feed himself and his patient, after all. A while later, a young girl appears at his door. She is Monet, the daughter of his friend who gave him the clothes for Regere. She usually comes for errands, however today she is simply here out of curiosity. She wants to confirm if he actually has an elf at his workshop. A child's innocent fascination can bring no harm to the elf, so he decides to let her see Regere. Maybe this will even distract her from her own thoughts. She gets really excited to see Regere seated there and starts shooting all the childlike questions that reside in her little mind. Regere obviously stays silent throughout her interrogation. However, the apothecary keeps answering all of Monet's questions on her behalf. He doesn't know how truthful his answers are, but still, they're better than silence. He is simultaneously working on a special project as he tries to fix something for Regere. He wonders if she will like his sloppy creation. It is better than nothing, he figures. The next second, Regere has a flower crown on her head. That makes Monet giggle, giving words to a fantasy, saying that she is the apothecary's bride now. Hearing the word bride gets him to quickly dismiss her silly idea and tells her that the elf is simply his patient. He is glad that Monet has treated her with warmth and a childlike innocence. Furthermore, would she have liked this flower crown? How would she have reacted if she could see it? He knows that the chances of returning her vision are slim, but he will give her the drops that he has. When can we finally get to see her talk? We can't hold back the emotions. The full recovery will obviously take a while, but in the meantime, he needs to look after her skin and give her eye drops as well. Giving her food that's edible and easy on the stomach is a top priority as well. A good massage and repositioning will help her with her blood circulation. All this time, he has also been working on her dentures by taking help from a few library books. He spends some time getting the perfect size, and poor Regere has to endure days of his readjusting her new teeth, but the end result is totally worth it. Regere has the perfect teeth now. He can finally check this thing off his bucket list. The apothecary decides to take help from a friend, since Regere's necrosis in the limbs is slowly progressing. Even though it's not normal for him, asking for someone's aid is the only option left in the cards. His deep thoughts about this course of action are interrupted by the arrival of the local cattleman, who has come bearing meat as a gift. He is thankful to the apothecary for helping him with his lower back the other day, and is here now to show his gratitude. He decides to preserve a portion of the meat and cook the rest. Meat for lunch and dinner sounds delicious after a long while. He cooks the tough part in the stew, and the tender part is cooked as the steak, with all the spices that can make anyone's mouth water. The food is ready, and he wonders how long it has been since Regere's had meat. Maybe a long while. However, thanks to the dentures, she can finally have some solid food. The moment of truth arrives as he feeds her the first bite, and her reaction is more than satisfactory. She loves the meat and starts stuffing her cheeks with the food, with no care in the world. Her cheeks blush and saliva drips down her lips. Looks like someone is enjoying their meal, which makes us thank God that she is on the right hands. The apothecary decides to write a message to an old friend, hoping that he can help him with Regere. Among the various methods of delivery, he only knows one, which is using the messenger crow. Using the crow may be the most feasible option, since it can be really fast with its flying abilities. He releases the crow into the air with his message attached. 
Hopefully, it will fulfill its mission. They start waiting for the response with every passing day. They go back to their normal life, where he works and Regere sits and watches. Monet comes over to visit her a few times as well. However, he notices that Regere has started gaining some of her responsiveness back, which is a great sign. He starts hoping that any day now, she will start talking. Until, she falls ill, which is super surprising. He observes her symptoms which are a fever, spasms, bloodshot eyes, and redness on her chest. His diagnosis tells him that these are the same symptoms as those caused by the bite of an obsidian spider. He looks at her coughing up blood and comes to the conclusion. Someone has given her a slow-acting poison. But who? Obsidian spiders are large creatures with a potent venom that has been used in assassinations since ancient times. However, no one in the village knows about this spider for sure, and the shopkeeper from the city isn't this bright either. This leaves him with one suspect, her previous owner. Why won't he leave her alone? He knows that he needs to work fast, since the poison has just started spreading in her body, and saving her life is still a possibility. He cleans out her stomach, and gives her the herbs necessary to expel the poison. He encourages her to hang on to him, to her life, and not let go at any cost. This is when a pill-shaped object comes out of her body covered in gastric juice. Of course, it's not an actual medical pill. It is a thick husk with ancient writing on it and a curse mark. Whoever her previous owner was, he has dramatically held on to her. He thinks back from the time he found her with all her wounds, and now the poison. It looks like someone is telling her to go and die somewhere where no one cares about her. Why does this person have so much hate for her? He feels an uncontrollable rage building up inside him, a red mist of fury which he has to keep in check since he has a patient to treat, a duty to perform. He has to work on the antidote for the poison, and to do that, he needs all the ingredients. One slight problem is that the ingredients can only be found out in the wild, and he decides to go hunt them himself. He turns to Monet and her mother, Anne, for help in this regard, requesting them to keep Resere with them and look after her. They readily and happily agree to help him out. However, since he's the apothecary, he needs to tell them what to do and how to treat her if her condition worsens. Out in the wild, he collects all of the ingredients and comes back successful after two days. He starts making the injection using a dragon fang, adding herbs and some of the poison from the spider to create the antidote. Two days pass since he is out to collect the ingredients, and he hopes that Regere is holding up well in his absence. An apothecary should not be away from his patient in such a state, but this was necessary to save her life. Thanks to Anne and Monet's care, Regere's condition has not worsened. He injects the fang with the antidote into her shoulder, reassuring Regere that she doesn't have to worry about dying yet, since she is going to get better soon enough. Regere is drowning when she hears someone calling her. All the reassurances and kind words and the kind helping hand that she sees gives her the power to fight the darkness and break all the shackles. She knows that it is painful and dark wherever she is, and she has to either get out of here or die a miserable death. She hears a voice calling out her name. Maybe it's not the time to give up on herself just yet. She reaches out to the kind arm that wants to bring her out of this misery, and this is the best plan of action for her. The moment she opens her one good eye, she finds that she can finally see light, after living in darkness for… she is unsure about the timeline herself. The antidote has worked wonders, with Regere not only regaining consciousness, but she has started to speak as well. Surprisingly, some of her eyesight is back too, since she can tell light and darkness apart. The apothecary doesn't know the exact reasons behind the miraculous vision recovery, but deduces that the antidote had a restorative effect on her eyesight with all the ingredients from the wild. He is extremely thankful for her recovery, however, he doesn't seem to understand why she won't give him any straight answers about herself. Where is her hometown? Does she even have a nickname? If she did have a nickname, she doesn't know him well enough to reveal it yet anyway. However, she seems to have lost all of her previous memory before arriving in the village. Maybe it's for the best, since she never had good memories throughout her life as a slave. It is time to make better and happier memories and leave the past behind. He should stop trying to remind her about the past as well and encourage her to look forward to the future. She thanks him for saving her life in broken words and a broken voice. The hope of a good future in her tone makes him realize that not only did he save her, she saved him a little bit as well. 
What is it about her that affects him so much when he had never felt this way before? He doesn't get much time to interrogate Resere about anything important because a local farmer stops by to present the apothecary with another gift, a massive pumpkin. Do all of his patients keep dropping by to leave oversized gifts? He'll never go hungry at this rate. He decides to cook the pumpkin right away, or at least he wanted to, until Anne and Monet enter the workshop to check in on him. With one look at the pumpkin, they force him to take a break and rest, as he seems to have bags under his eyes. As a man of science, he should know that he shouldn't overwork himself while they prepare a pumpkin pie to celebrate Regere's recovery. Of course, he can't refuse when it comes to Regere and her recovery, because this is his biggest achievement. He is delighted to see that Regere is chatting away with everyone without a trace of her previous sadness in her eyes. She even loves the pumpkin pie, which uplifts everyone's moods at the table. She is finally starting to look like a normal person who can live a more pleasant life, surrounded by good people. Maybe the fact that she was bedridden and stuck with poison until last night was a bad dream. He decides that he will help her physically first and worry about her memories later. Getting his priorities straight is important at this point. Unexpectedly, that's when his long-lost messenger, the crow, arrives, bearing a reply from his friend. His friend's reply is weirdly worded, where he agrees to play around with her, but not for free. No one wants to do something they're good at for free, which isn't totally inappropriate, as he has every right to charge a patient for treatment. He knows he doesn't have any other option if he wants Regere's limbs healed. His friend may be weird, but he is a damn good doctor. He'll worry about paying him later, as his friend can work on credit for him. He starts making travel plans since his friend lives further up in the north. The journey will take five days, and they will be gone for a while. He puts all of his valuables and dangerous chemicals in a sealed storage. Coming to Regere's winter wardrobe, he tries to make her fit into his clothes, which are too baggy, making him apologize to her for being a cheapskate. She may be an elf, but she is still a girl who must like to dress up well, no matter what. Changing the topic, he suggests that they should write a reply to the friend. Meanwhile, he can think about what to do with her clothes. He knows that they will have to make a detour and stop at the city for a little shopping. He can't let the girl think that he's too broke to get her warm clothes. Additionally, he can't let her freeze to death on the road either. He has decided to do the shopping alone, as Regere will surely attract attention in the city. Moreover, he had told the old shopkeeper that he had sold the elf to another doctor the last time he saw him. He can't just show up with her beside him after lying to the shopkeeper, as he has to save his reputation as well. He walks throughout the city to shop for clothes, and while buying women's clothing is not as suspicious, buying their underwear is extremely awkward for him. He has to make up a story about buying all this stuff for a female relative of his, but no one's buying that story, are they? Even if they believed his story, he knows that he will never be able to forget their weird stares, ever. But he has to move on, and try to forget about this situation. Distracting himself, he loads his horse with all the shopping bags and starts moving towards his workshop. His horse has slowed down with all the weight of the clothes and food, but he reaches back somehow. Thankfully, this day is finally over for him. The morning of their departure arrives, and it is a chilly day. Thank God for all the codes, or else they would have frozen to their deaths. Regere wears the white clothes that he bought for her, and he's proud that they fit perfectly. Maybe he should consider an alternate career as a personal shopper and stylist. She's also wearing a necklace with a magic sensor in it, which is important to keep a track on her. However, the apothecary is sad that she can't appreciate her clothes with her own eyes, since her eyesight is not completely back. One day, her eyes will light up with the way she looks, and he will make sure of it. Their plan is to walk north for half a day, cross a forest, and go towards the nearest portal place. It sounds simple enough, but he has to carry her all the way, as she can't walk so much. She's apologetic about the fact he has to carry her, as she is so heavy. However, he doesn't mind, as she isn't as heavy as the ingredients he always has to carry. The apothecary and the elf have a long journey ahead, and they have been walking for half a day. They haven't made much progress, as he is trying to be careful and avoid dangerous routes. They have to pick up their pace if they don't want to be stuck on the road for more days than expected. They have decided to set up their camp early as it's getting dark, and carrying her is kinda tiring for him. Plus, all the emergency items are also way too heavy, and he shouldn't have brought so many things in the first place. 
While deciding the place for the camp and making all the arrangements, he realizes that this is the first time since he cured her from the poison that they are able to sit down and have alone time. Just the two of them. What are they even going to talk about? This might just be the perfect opportunity for them to get to know each other better. This is the first time that Regere has started a conversation, and she begins with asking him his name. Of course, it has been a long time since they have been living together, and she still doesn't know what to call him. He doesn't want to tell her his name yet, and asks her to call him Apothecary since this is his job. Without digging any further into the matter, she accepts his unclear reply and calls him Mr. Apothecary. He is worried that she will try to dig deeper into the matter, but surprisingly, she has accepted everything without any further questions. He doesn't want them to get attached or have such personal knowledge about each other since their relationship will only last until he has healed her and sent her back to her home place. The next morning arrives quite soon, and they have to resume their journey. They walk through the depths of the forest towards their portal place, and their spirits become higher as they can finally see an end to their long road. Longer journeys are too tiring for everyone, especially when you are on foot. However, their luck isn't too great when it comes to avoiding danger, so they encounter a King Grizzly, who is quite fierce and troublesome without their winter rest. How are they supposed to deal with it? The Apothecary may have been able to fight it off one way or another if he was alone, but he can't risk putting Regere's life in danger by making any rash decisions. But does he even have a choice? The options are to finish off the King Grizzly or die at his hands, and his decision is clear when he puts a hand on his blade. If he's smart about it, he can easily catch the monster off guard and save himself and his traveling companion. However, he is distracted by a voice coming from behind him. Is there another King Grizzly out here? Fighting off one of them is doable, but dealing with two at the same time is impossible. But this voice doesn't sound like King Grizzly's, as it's neither a cry nor a song, just a clear, resonant voice. He is shocked to turn around and find out that the voice belongs to Regere. What is she even trying to do? His questions are soon answered when the bear calms down after listening to her voice. It returns to the bushes, leaving the duo alone, where the apothecary is still shell-shocked. This is the first time that he has ever seen Regere act like an elf, a resident of the forest. He asks her outright if she can talk to animals, as this question is too important to just let go. However, he doesn't push her to answer, as she looks confused herself. She doesn't know what she did, since she was just trying to calm the bear down as it looked scared to her. What other cool abilities does she have hidden behind her traumatic existence? They continue their trek, hoping that they don't come across more monsters and animals. However, they are in the middle of the forest, and it is obvious that they can't avoid all the different creatures that have made it their home. This theory is proven when they encounter a giant snake in the middle of the forest. The snake is massive, and it might be the reason behind the bear being so scared. It does look terrifying, and such mutated creatures seem to be appearing quite often in the forest, which may be due to the influence of bad mana. The apothecary has been theorizing about the snake the whole time, until he realizes that they can't ignore the snake. It is huge enough to cause damage to the nearby villages, and he can't let this happen. His decision is finalized when he puts Regere down and takes a sip of the strengthening potion. This makes his body stronger, however he needs a better weapon to fight a mutated creature like this one. He takes out his blade and applies vibration magic on it. Coupled with a strong weapon, he brings down the giant snake beast in a matter of minutes. This apothecary can be a great hunter if he ever decides to leave the field of science. He knows that the snake has managed to wound him, but it isn't fatal. This wound isn't going to ruin their trip, so they decide to move on and be done with this weird road as soon as possible. The apothecary has to make sure that the snake wound wouldn't cause any problems, so he gives himself an anti-venom injection. As a doctor, he knows that precaution is better than cure. They finally arrive at the valley city of Kalga on the second evening after leaving the workshop. They have made good time, despite coming across different kinds of obstacles on the way. The city of Kalga has the nearest portal. However, teleportation is not everyone's cup of tea, and he is worried that Regere might get sick because of it, so he decides that they will get a place to stay at the north city where they will be teleported to. Even though portals are a convenient way of traveling, they are quite expensive. Peasants can't use portals as easily, so they are mainly used by nobles and government officials. 
He is aware about all the problems and getting the portal license, and that the operators are mostly unsympathetic and calculating, since they get troublesome customers. Plus, they earn a lot of their money from bribes. It sounds like he doesn't trust these operators much, but he is willing to use their greed to their advantage. Reaching the portal office, they find the operator to be a bit too judgmental, who is looking at Regere with a scowl. After a few minutes of silence, he refuses to serve Regere, as she is a long-eared species. The apothecary can't believe his ears, and tries to reason with the operator, saying that she is just a patient looking to get treated. However, the officer is stubborn, and tells him that he can still tell that she is an elf by looking at her skin color, eyes, and hair. However, he can get a special goods transport permit, which will cost a bit more. The apothecary is shocked and angry with all this discrimination against other species that became common about 80 years ago. But he knows that Regere needs her treatment, and he will never let anyone get in the way just because of her race and make him treat her like an object. His anger becomes obvious when he asks the operator to figure out a way to skip all the paperwork. The operator can see that his anger can be dangerous, so he agrees to let them go through the portal instantly. They leave happily, as they have managed to come to an agreement, while the operator is glad that he is still alive, since he thought that the apothecary would kill him at some point. They are transported to North Vale, a town further north, in a flash, where they start searching for lodging right away. They deserve a night of peace and quiet after so much frustration. They manage to get a room with one bed, which is cramped, but good enough to get some sleep. They have a nice meal at the lodge, but they aren't to stay up for long, since they fall asleep as soon as they lay down on the bed, as they are both extremely tired from the long travel, and the effects of the magic waves of the portal have finally caught up with them. When he wakes up, the first thing he sees is Regere snuggling up to him. He looks at her up close, and finds her looking too innocent in her sleep. He gives in to her cuddles, and decides to sleep in a little longer and enjoy the peace and quiet before he has to face a brand new day again. The apothecary wakes up confused after he has a weird dream where he has to dress Regere up as Santa Claus. The whole dream is still unclear to him, but he knows one thing for sure, that it is not normal at all for him. The duo has breakfast at the lodge a few moments later, and head out to shop before resuming their journey. He has tried to maintain a respectable distance with her after this morning's dreamy episode. Maybe she just slipped into her dream after all the cuddles. They leave North Vale on a deer carriage, which is an interesting choice of transportation and not as tiring as walking. They still have a half a day's journey ahead of them before they can reach his friend's place in the mountains. How far is his place exactly? It feels like they've been traveling for months. They have yet another chance to have a conversation before reaching their destination, so Regere asks him why he is so nice to her. This question has been bothering her, since no one has ever treated her so well before. However, she isn't sure if he's even going to tell her his reasons since he even refused to reveal his name to her. Although the apothecary has guarded his personal information until now, he decides to give her a little of his backstory, so he tells her that his life was also saved by someone, just like her. He was abandoned as a baby, and he would have died of starvation until a demon picked him up and saved his life. He knows that if someone hadn't stepped up at that time, he wouldn't be alive sitting in front of her. This is why he couldn't just turn away from her after he saw her in a helpless state. He feels that everyone deserves a chance to be saved. Regere understands his reasons and is extremely impressed with him as well. He changes the topic, telling her about the clothing of the far eastern land called Kimono. Regere doesn't mind this change in conversation either, and is actually interested to know more about kimonos. When did kimonos become an interesting topic of discussion? However, the apothecary finds himself fantasizing about her in a kimono. This weird desire to play dress up with Regere fills him with a sense of guilt as she is his patient and he shouldn't be having such thoughts about her. He really needs to control his imaginations if he wants to maintain a platonic relationship with Regere. The deer carriage is stopped at the foot of the summit as they have to walk the rest of the way up. Putting on their snowshoes, they begin their journey when the apothecary starts feeling a bit feverish and fatigued. The long journey is finally catching up to him and it's high time this little adventure comes to an end. He isn't sure if he's feeling unwell because of the snake venom or the cold. Shouldn't he be aware of the precise source of his sickness since he's an apothecary? The weather isn't helping his condition either as it starts snowing. Not being able to continue, they find an opening in the rocks to wait out the blizzard. The apothecary apologizes to her for ending up in a little cave. However, the poor elf thinks that even the change in the weather condition is her fault. Someone needs to tell her that the weather is not in her control. The apothecary's fever refuses to let up while they wait, and the blizzard only seems to be getting worse. They might just have to spend the whole night in this opening. He isn't too happy about sleeping on the cold floor, however, he doesn't have any choice but to rest a bit. So, he goes to sleep, perhaps dreaming about a warm bed with fluffy pillows. 
The snow settles the next morning, and they continue on their way. However, the apothecary is still sick and is making far less progress than he hoped. Moreover, his vision seems to start getting blurry as well. The situation gets more desperate, so he decides to send a rescue signal to his friend. Honestly, he should have done it a few moments earlier, but better late than never. However, the signal he sends is really weak, while his condition worsens even more. It looks like he's about to lose consciousness. Regere is worried about his condition, and wants to help him one way or the other. She remembers about the pendant that he had given her, and activates it. The pendant has a signaling magic, and hopefully it works since they don't have any other option. A few leagues away, on top of a cliff, a masked person spots the signal coming out of the pendant. The apothecary wakes up in a comfortable bed, thinking all of his hardships were just a dream. But he finds out that it was all a reality when he spots his demon friend Adam in the room. He is glad to see his old friend after such a long time. He is soon filled in on the previous day's events, and how they were picked up by Adam's servant. Adam scolds him for sending a weak signal that did not indicate their location properly. Of course, if he hadn't sent Gouache, his servant, to rescue them, they probably would have ended up freezing to death or been eaten alive by snow leopards. He is also told that his elf girl is fine, while Adam continues to scold him for overworking himself, trying to fight monsters, and not working on his mana. This surely has been a memorable morning for the apothecary. He can only hope that he won't get scolded the whole time he stays here, or else Regere might think that he is just a child who gets reprimanded all the time. The apothecary is clearly fond of Adamska, an ex-human, who has devoted his life to his extensive research about the body. He stocks fresh parts and conducts ethically questionable medical magic experiments, just because he doesn't know how else to satisfy his curiosity. A man of science only craves more and more knowledge. However, all of this does not mean that Adam is a bad demon. The apothecary has known him for a long time and can vouch for the fact that Adam is just weird and not evil. And unlike him, Adam is perfectly capable of handling Regere's arms and legs, which is basically the whole point of making this tiring and life-threatening journey. Adam is happy that the apothecary is fine, but coming straight to the point, he inquires about the money. He obviously means business, which is understandable. The apothecary shows him all the shiny coins that he has brought, which makes Adam happy as he won't have to worry about stocks for a while. His inner curious medic is also excited to be able to work with elf bones after a long time. Starting the treatment, Adamska starts to inspect Regere with his Alma, which is an innate magical ability linked with his soul that he has mastered with extreme training. Regere passed out during her examination, but thankfully she regained consciousness in time for dinner. At the dinner table, Adam tells the apothecary that Regere's condition is quite interesting, for lack of better words. Continuing his diagnosis, he also reveals that the damage to her skin and internal organs will heal naturally, but her limbs and eyes can cause some problems in the process. Even though her right eye has recovered, someone has intentionally blocked her sight with mana. But who could it have been with such evil intentions? On the other hand, her left eye is a lost cause, which cannot be fixed even with a replacement. Furthermore, her limbs have a corrosion spell on them, and are really infected, so the things are pretty intense in that department. It looks like someone intentionally does not want Regere to be better at all. However, one positive point is that Regere has the metabolism of an elf, which is slowing down the deterioration of the limbs, but this still doesn't make her condition any better. All of her injuries and limbs are difficult to heal. Has the apothecary's hesitation to amputate her limbs put her life in grave danger? If so, then how will he ever be able to live with this guilt? He knows that he has to save her limbs and the rest of her parts at any cost now. Adam has to be serious at this point, giving it to him straight that leaving the limbs as is can be lethal. He believes that cutting the limbs off right here is the only option left to them. They have figured out all the details of the surgery, but the only thing left is informing Regere about how her limbs are literally going to get chopped off. Who is even going to have this conversation with her? After a brief discussion, it is decided that the apothecary will be the one to disclose this news to her. Adam tells him not to waste any time and go to her this instant. However, he has something to tell Regere as well, and decides that he needs to be alone with her to tell her this. Can this be explosive information to her? While the apothecary walks toward Regere's room, Adam goes off to search for spare limbs that look like the right size in his collection. Even though he is a demon, is having a collection for limbs as normal as he makes it look like? Hopefully he will end up finding a perfect fit for Regere. Meanwhile, the apothecary has entered Regere's room, and she looks really peaceful lying down on her bed. She is even glad to see that he is okay. He tells her everything that Adam informed him, revealing that she has to undergo surgery since there is no other solution. Regere takes a moment to collect her thoughts and tells him that she is ready for the surgery as she trusts him. Her shoulders are visibly trembling as she says this. However, she tried to put up a strong front in front of him. He knows that it must be tough for her to hear this from a human she barely knows, but appreciates her deciding to take on this challenge. 
Regiray may look like a feeble elf, but her spirit is really strong. If she has survived this long after going through so many difficulties, it's obvious that she isn't an ordinary girl. The apothecary is also overwhelmed with the trust she has built in him, and decides that he will do everything in his power not to betray this. The time of the surgery draws nearer, and Adam has successfully found the perfect right arm and left leg for Regere after looking through his collection. Maybe he should allow people to shop for different body parts from his collection. They administer anesthesia using a dragon fang needle and tie her limbs. They have to take care of the hygiene requirement, so they sterilize everything before proceeding with the operation. Regere lies down, all ready to get this operation done with. She is given the anesthesia as the two medical men start off with the surgery. One of them severs her limbs with the vibrating knife, so her cuts are treated well. The other connects the flesh and bones, making sure that everything fits together. During this time, Regere keeps opening her right eye every now and then, looking around in a trance. The apothecary is glad that the anesthesia has worked, since no one can handle the pain of getting all four of their limbs cut off. Thanks to Adam's vast experience, the procedure seems to be going well, increasing the apothecary's hopes for Regere's recovery. The operation has been a great success, thanks to Adam who was able to grasp the position of the nerves and the bones perfectly with his magic. Moreover, the limbs that he chose from the collection for her looked okay on her, not making her appear ghastly. During the whole time, the apothecary notices that Adam keeps muttering some things to himself and giggling as he looks at her limbs, but he tries to pretend that he didn't see that for his own sake. After all, no one wants to admit that their friends are weird. They leave Regere to rest for a while, until Gouache calls them back when she has finally woken up. She is glad that the surgery is finally over now, even though all the lightness feels weird to her. She can't feel her limbs just yet, and she might be going through a lot of pain for some time. However, she is finally safe as all of the corrosion is gone now. Apparently, she also has to do some recovery exercises for the nerves and mana channels to work properly. Adam claims that his work here is done, as he can't babysit her the entire time. This is an indication to the apothecary that she is his problem now. However, he doesn't mind, and is only glad because Adam's skills have been the real deal in successfully removing the corrosion and replacing her limbs. Of course, he charged well for his skills, but the apothecary doesn't care much about the money anyway. They stay over at Adam's after the surgery, while the apothecary fully recovers from all the fatigue he has been feeling. Moreover, they need to be at his mansion to monitor Regere's condition, which is unpredictable anyway. All this time, Adam has made the apothecary work like a slave, making him clean the whole mansion, including his cold storage. It looks like Adam can be a pretty tough master to work for. However, the apothecary doesn't mind, as he wants to repay him for his help. He has been checking up on Regere as well. During one of their routine checkups, he inquires about the dentures, which hurt her a bit, but she seems fine. He gets really excited watching her fingers move, but Regere can't share his sentiments, as she is still unable to feel any sensation in her fingers. She can at least pretend to be happy, can't she? The nerves in her fingers have started to wake up, even though her eyesight and sense of touch aren't fully recovered yet. However, it still gives him hope that she will eventually be able to move her new arm if they continue the exercises. As the days pass, Regere's nerves finally start to connect, so it's decided that it's time for them to finally return to the apothecary's workshop. Are they ready for yet another journey already? Before they have to leave, Adam checks up on Regere one last time to make sure that the new limbs won't be causing any problems. Remembering that he had to talk to her privately before she leaves, he takes her to the terrace for their secret discussion, making the apothecary wonder what it can be about. Out on the terrace, Adam begins the conversation by telling her that the female parts of her body have been heavily damaged. Hopefully, she wasn't expecting him to give her good news before this intense start. Continuing his concern, he reveals that her condition is not unfixable, but the procedures will be risky for her. Basically, he wants her to know all of her options before she can make a decision. Their talk lasts for a few minutes, not even long enough to cool down a cup of hot tea in winter mornings. They seem to be fully invested in their conversation, as they don't even move an inch from their spot. When they start coming back, the apothecary notices the expressions on their faces, and it clicks that their topic of discussion was anything but lighthearted. Is this a point of concern for him as well, or is it such a private matter that could not be discussed in front of him? The apothecary and Regere get ready to leave for home, and she clearly looks upset for some reason. Maybe she's getting bothered just thinking about the road trip ahead. Interrupting their preparations, Adam tells the apothecary that he wants to give him something, making him follow his steps to the mansion's basement. They find themselves in the storage room where the apothecary gets excited after looking at something. It's soon revealed that the thing waiting for them in here is an air growl, which is a custom-made piece of Dorvan technology that the apothecary savior used to ride. The technology was supposed to be missing, but Adam seems to have found it somehow. However, he doesn't seem to have any use for it, so he is offering it to the apothecary. They can use it to get back home. Does this mean they won't have to travel for days this time? How convenient that will be. About to leave, Regere bids goodbye to Adam, promising to help him with the chores the next time they visit. However, Adam doesn't seem too eager to invite them back, since all of his research is done with the elf body. Well, at least he's upfront about it, instead of being fake to their face. 
They start the air growl, which uses mana stones to propel itself through the air, and leave the mansion. The apothecary is glad to have received the air growl, but is aware of its high energy consumption and maintenance requirements as well, which is why he decides to not use it once they reach back home. They are back home at the workshop for a week, and the apothecary has decided that there's just no place like home. He's also stashed the air growl on the porch, which means that he really meant it when he said that he will not use it again. Regere seems to be feeling fine as well, and the surgery hasn't caused any complications apparently. Moreover, the rest of the wounds on Regere's body are healing as nicely as they can, and soon enough, she will have her smooth skin back. With Regere now conscious, it is a little awkward for the apothecary to give her a bath, so Anna Monet arrive to solve this problem for him by inviting Regere to tag along with them when they go to a bath. She enjoys herself in the warm bath, while the apothecary hopes that it will help her feel more relaxed. Anne and Monet stay back for dinner with the duo, after they help Regere with her bath. Her scars look better, it seems like the bath was a good idea after all. The apothecary applied salve on her wounds, hoping that they would heal even further. He doesn't want her to look her pitiful self. Does he expect her inner wounds to heal this way as well? He also has another thing on his agenda, cutting Regere's hair. The apothecary is not an experienced hairdresser for sure, but he knows that cutting her is necessary for her to come to terms with her identity. She has grown out her bangs to hide her face and wounds, but there is no need to do that anymore. Furthermore, the apothecary has also made her an eye patch to protect the sunken left eye. He continues to cut her bangs shorter and adjust the eye patch on her face. She finally looks like a normal girl, even with the pirate-like eye patch, and he hopes that now she might not attract the attention of the village anymore. The apothecary doesn't have to spend all of his time looking after Regere anymore, so he decides to return to business as usual. Now he can take care of other patients who can pay for his services. Plus, he highly enjoys doing his work and his long vacation is finally over. He works in his workshop during the day, giving out medicines to the needy or checking different patients who visit him. In the meantime, Regere rests outside and hangs out with nature, while absorbing mana from the atmosphere to replenish her magic. After all, she is a magical elf and has mana throughout her body. After he is done with work, the apothecary helps Regere with some exercises for her limbs. He wants to accelerate the process, so he stimulates her muscles with electric and vibration magic. The process is obviously really painful for the girl, but it has to be done. Furthermore, there is a new determination in her eyes, which she had never seen before. It looks like she actually wants to be better now, and doesn't wish to just die a meaningless death anymore. The ragged elf has finally decided to give life a chance, and he will help her achieve it. The duo has steadily continued their recovery exercises, and not every day is a good day for them. One day, it seems like they're doing good and making progress, while on other days, it feels like they're stuck in one place with no improvement. But one thing is for certain, they are not going to give up hope. During this time, Regere has worked a lot on her speech, and her words have become much clearer. They can communicate with each other by having real conversations now, even though her memories are still blurry, but that's the headache for another day. Today it's time for another one of their sessions, and the apothecary instructs her to try bending her wrist and the elbow, since he wants her to get back her movement abilities and her joints. When Regere tries to do this, her hand starts glowing, and the apothecary is taken aback. She is actually using magic with her hands now, and it feels surreal for the apothecary to witness it. Regere explains to him that she wanted to give him a surprise, but she couldn't control her magic as he had held her hand for the first time, which is why her magic has shown itself to him without her permission. It looks like she felt something a lot more after making physical contact with the apothecary, and whatever it was, it must have been a magical sensation. She looks rather happy after making this mistake, and reveals that she had gained control of her hand this morning. The first thing she started doing was practicing channeling magic through her newly recovered hand. She must have missed feeling magic on her fingertips all this time, and now she can use it whenever she wants. Having so much power in her hands after not being able to use them must be a great feeling for her. The apothecary is shocked by the pace of her recovery, but is proud of Regere for putting so much effort into her exercises. Only her determination has allowed to find so much success in such a short span of time. The apothecary has a delivery from the local craftsman, and is delighted to find that his order is just how he imagined it. Is this another one of his oversized gifts from the villagers? Moving on, he asks Regere to try it, and it's revealed that the mysterious object is a wheelchair. He has ordered the wheelchair so the duo is better prepared for any future travel plans. Of course, he can't carry Regere on his back during entire journeys, as it slows them down and almost breaks his back. He isn't going to sign up for that whenever they have to go out together. However, the apothecary can't believe that the chair has turned out so perfectly, even though he was the one who came up with the sketch for it. The local craftsman is really talented, isn't he? The wheelchair is an imitation of something he had seen in the capital, and since he has got this one made by a specialist, it promises to be durable. 
it isn't going to break anytime soon, and the elf can have a lot of fun while sitting on it as well. Regeret is obviously curious about this chair with wheels, which keeps moving, but she will definitely grow to like it after she is fully sure that it won't end up being the cause of her death. The apothecary has found out that the dentures he made for Regeret are getting loose, so he decides to make new ones for her. First, he has to take out her old dentures, which is a messy process as well, but he manages to do it. Furthermore, he fixes the new ones in her mouth and hopes that they will hold up well for her. He obviously has to take care of her dental hygiene if he wants her to return to her home place after regaining all those lost memories. He obviously can't let her go without a healthy set of teeth to her house, right? But for now, he has to make some dinner for both of them. Thinking about her new dentures, he decides to make the food extra easy to chew today. He really is a thoughtful gentleman when it comes to her well-being. The dinner is ready and on the table, where Regere has started to eat with her own hands now, and it turns out that she loves the fish paste that the apothecary has prepared. He really does know how to make an elf's mouth water with his amazing recipes for peculiar dishes. Even though Regere doesn't have full control of her hand, she can move her arm a bit, so he lets her eat by herself as practice. She looks really happy to finally be able to carry the food to her mouth on her own, but the apothecary is feeling left out. After all, he was the one who had to feed her for months, and suddenly, he doesn't have that job anymore. It's a bittersweet feeling for him. The apothecary gets two extra days off from the workshop every month, and he decides to use it to help Regere. He knows that she can use magic, and figures it will be a great idea for her to replenish her internal magic reserves. Plus, he needs a holiday as well. Keeping this in mind, they have decided to rest and recharge at a place filled with mana, which is located not too far away from the workshop either. This is their mini getaway where there is not a soul around to disturb their peace. She sits on her new wheelchair, while the apothecary pushes it from behind. It is a little wobbly, but it makes their traveling much easier. It is also a big help to the apothecary's back, which doesn't have to carry extra weight for miles. His limbs are probably thanking him for his idea right now. They have found the perfect spot to have lunch, so they take a break in the middle of nature. A picnic sounds delightful at this moment. Regere's heart is filled with gratitude and love for the people in the place where she has found so much care, and now she desires to stay here forever. The apothecary couldn't have imagined a scene like this a few months ago. He knows that she is recovered enough to go back to her home when her memories come back, and when that happens, his duties will finally come to an end. Does this mean that he doesn't want to take care of her anymore? However, he has realized that he should make his plans and intentions clear with Regere before she grows too close to this place and himself, as he doesn't want to break her heart when she eventually does have to leave forever. The apothecary can't stand the silence and calm of the forest, and begins talking with a deep emotion in his voice. It looks like he is finally going to reveal a chunk of his past. He tells her that he didn't help her out of the goodness of his heart, but rather for his own selfish reasons. His opening statement is a bit confusing for the elf, so he really needs to be more upfront about what he is trying to say. Regere has never heard him talk like this, so she is a bit dumbfounded while he continues to tell her that he has killed demons, elves, and dwarves with his hands. He only became an apothecary and helped her to atone for his own sins. He feels like a hypocrite and a fake who has killed countless people and now pretends to be a good person. He doesn't understand why he started telling her his whole life story, when he only wanted to suggest that they should start looking for her hometown. Maybe he finally wanted to tell her everything he has ever done, or does he expect her to hate him for all the crimes he has committed against her own kind? The apothecary suggests that she should keep her stay with him short. It looks like he doesn't trust himself with her, or doesn't want his evil heart to influence her good heart in any way. Regere doesn't know how to react to his confession but the only thing she knows is that this person has put an immense amount of effort into caring for her when they didn't even know each other's names. Not everyone out there is so kind to someone like her. He didn't have to do all those things for her, but he did. He could have just given her a few medicines and waited for her to get better, but he did everything in his power to save her life. After all, who else will travel all the way to the north for her? Even though she doesn't have any memories of her past and has no idea about his past either, her body and soul are fully aware of how caring he can be. She knows her intuition is right, and she has to listen to what her heart is saying. This is why the first thing to come out of her mouth in response to his suggestion is that he saved her life. She isn't going to be scared of him after hearing his backstory, since she has only seen the kind version of the apothecary. A person's past sins don't define him for the rest of his life, when he clearly feels guilty. The apothecary is scarred by his history, and thinks that the only reason he revealed everything about him is to seek validation from her, as he can't bear his sins anymore. He already knows that she wouldn't reject him, and thanks her for her trust in him. He can't force her to go away from him, so he asks if she has any memories about her hometown, like smells, images, scenery, or even weather. The smallest hint can help him crack the code, and find her hometown somehow. However, Regere has other things on her mind, 
She knows that she has always been relying on him, which is why she has never actually looked, but always felt something dark and heavy behind him. Besides, it's not like she could see with her less than perfect vision. She notices his eyes as they face each other properly for the first time, and blurts out the one thing she remembers about her hometown, which is red eyes and black hair. Wait, how did she notice his eyes when hers don't even work? The apothecary wonders if this is about a relative or friend of hers, but he soon finds himself in utter shock after focusing on her words. She reveals that she can see now, and is fascinated with the way her savior's face looks. It isn't clear if the eye drops have finally taken an effect, or if her will to see beyond the darkness has broken a psychological barrier. The truth of the matter for now is that she has regained her vision. The apothecary's happiness is short-lived, as he believes that helping one person is not going to rid him of his sin. He has to do a lot more to fully erase the blood of countless innocents from his hands. However, her miraculous recovery and will to move forward has made him realize that he is the one who is saved. This is the moment where he feels their relationship changing, ever so slightly. Does this mean her eyesight has brought them closer together? They return back to the workshop after getting the mana recharge. He decides to give her a quick tour of the workshop since it's her first time actually seeing it, even after living here for a few months. He shows her the shelves where he keeps his medicine and she can finally see the view of what she used to stare at when her vision was still dark. After the tour and initial excitement, the sun begins to set, and it's time for Regere to do her exercises and get ready to sleep, which includes changing. And of course, he is the one who has to help change her. She starts shaking when he begins to assist her. Her sweat is also out of control. Regere knows that he has changed her clothes a thousand times, but it's particularly embarrassing now that she can see. On the other hand, the apothecary is only thinking about her treatment, thinking that she is shaking due to a mental problem. The idea that she is embarrassed and blushing doesn't even cross his mind. He concludes that if they want her to be able to move on her own, they'll have to get her a left arm and a right leg, which requires a lot of funds. The apothecary needs to find a way to make money, and Regere needs to continue doing her leg exercises. Let's see if they succeed at these assigned tasks. The duo have continued doing leg exercises together, as well as the arm exercises. She has learned to move her new legs, but she isn't going to dance around the house anytime soon, since her complete recovery is a long way to go. The apothecary decides to make her try some advanced motions, like standing up and sitting down, to stimulate the thigh muscle while he supports her. The exercise session starts with an exciting beginning, when the apothecary loses his balance while trying to be Regere's support. Since his body doesn't have the practice of being someone's support, they both fall to the ground with Regere on top of him. The elf is completely embarrassed after finding his face too close to hers, as they have never been in such close contact with each other. They stay like this for a few seconds, while exchanging apologies and blushing cheeks with each other. It definitely is a difficult road ahead for the both of them if they keep falling on top of each other like this. Rumors and words spread fast everywhere, including the apothecary's village. Everyone has heard about Regere regaining her eyesight, and this good news is appreciated throughout. The first visitors to offer their congratulations are Anne and Monet. The little girl is so excited to meet Regere that her mother has a hard time convincing her to make a detour so they can grab something for the elf. Regere is sitting outside on the patio when the apothecary leads Anna Monet there. The elf instantly recognizes her old friends and is happy to see that they have brought a bouquet for her. Monet tells her that they have gathered the flowers on their own for her, since she can see now. Regere knows that the flowers are ordinary, but the feeling behind them was too deep to ignore. The apothecary is also aware that Regere's recovery has also been made possible because of Anna Monet's efforts of being there for her. Regere is extremely delighted with all the attention and love she is getting, and her smile shines brighter than ever this afternoon. The duo is preparing dinner with Anne and Monet. The little girl compliments Regere's eye, since the apothecaries are so black. This makes the elf turn to look at her savior, who seems too happy. They all have a pleasant dinner together, among endless conversation and a feeling of a wholesome evening. After the dinner, Regere stops Anne to have a chat before she starts to leave, asking her if she and the apothecary are together. He looked so happy standing with Anne a few moments earlier that this is the first thing that came to Regere's mind. However, Anne laughs it off, thinking that Regere is just too cute. She still manages to scold the apothecary for not telling Regere that she has a husband, even though he's not home right now. The apothecary should be more careful, and never forget such details, since Adam also used to complain about his lack of common sense. The apothecary has a wandering merchant, who drops by his workshop to give him some ingredients. These ingredients include the rarest herbs from all over the land. However, aside from this, he also brings news from all over the country. Traveling is useful, especially when it comes to being well informed. This time, the merchant has a different request for the apothecary. He begins by telling him that the flow of mana has been pretty bad lately. 
a lot of his colleagues are getting attacked by monsters and beasts, and it's obviously becoming a problem. No one wants to end up being eaten alive by a monster. The Apothecary has had a similar experience with the Grizzly Bear that attacked him in the mountains when he was traveling with Resure. The merchant continues with his request and comes straight to the point. He's wondering if the Apothecary has some sort of beast repellent. Is he looking for some kind of spray that he can blind the huge beasts with? The Apothecary comes up with a better solution than a spray, and gives him a mix of tobacco and herbs that smell unpleasant to the beasts. However, this request reminds him of the time Regere used her voice to calm the bear they met on their way to Adam. How did she stop the big old bear with just her voice? The Apothecary can't seem to forget the time when Regere stopped the big old King Grizzly with her voice, and he can't handle his curiosity anymore. He wants to ask her how she did it, but it seems like this idea came to her through her natural instincts, rather than an ability that she knew she had. When he asks her, Regere replies that the bear was scared of the Apothecary. The voices he made were too cold, like a blade. Looks like it could sense the Apothecary's bloodlust. Regere just figured that it was just her way of letting the bear know that it's okay and no one will hurt it. Well, it would definitely be reassuring for anyone to hear that they aren't in danger, and it certainly worked for the King Grizzly. The Apothecary agrees that she is right. If an animal is afraid of you, there should be a way to let it know that no harm will be done to it. Maybe he can make a magical tool for this purpose as well. At least, it will reduce the chances of him getting attacked by enormous bears in the future. The Apothecary's scientific brain gets to work immediately. He knows that some ancient ruins have traps that replicate a Mandragora's scream. What if he tries to come up with something similar that can replicate Regere's voice on demand? He can use her voice to pacify beasts whenever he wants. It's worth giving it a try, isn't it? However, he figures that he will need vibration magic since this idea is connected to sound. Of course, he hasn't used this magic for such a purpose before, but there's a first time for everything. He tells his plan to Regere and asks for help in his idea as well. Regere can't contain her excitement after hearing about his plans and is ready to help him in any way she can. He puts a stone in front of her, which is a bit confusing. Is she supposed to sing into this stone? However, he asks her to sing normally, and says he'll handle the recording part. Is the stone going to capture her voice, or is it just here to confuse everyone? The duo is done with their experiment, and the apothecary puts the stone aside with the recording of Regere's song. Now, he has to wait for the wandering merchant to stop by again. Looks like the merchant is going to be the first one to actually try out this experiment. For now, they have stopped obsessing over the stone, and continue doing exercises for Regere's left leg so that she can travel someday. The poor elf is really apologetic for taking up so much of his time every evening with her exercises. She must feel like a burden on him. However, the apothecary doesn't mind at all, as these exercises are nothing compared to what he had to do in the past. He begins kneading her left leg, which had been steadily recovering. Although it wasn't at the point of her right arm yet, he believes that she will be able to move it freely soon enough. She won't be dependent on him then, and will probably stop feeling like she is causing a huge disturbance in his life, even though he doesn't mind. The apothecary thinks that she will probably need a crutch to walk, but his line of thought is interrupted by none other than Regere herself. The apothecary notices that Regere wants to say something after the exercises, so he makes her sit down to talk. She doesn't know where to begin, so they have to start with a few trivial questions. There is a brief moment of silence in the middle as well, before she finally gains the confidence to say what she wants and looks straight at him. She starts off by saying that she has been thinking a lot, and she is aware that he always takes care of her, no matter what. But, in return, she wants to be useful for him in other ways too, well, obviously apart from singing into a stone. She wants to help him out in his workshop, which leaves the poor apothecary in confusion since he has always treated her like a patient. However, the apothecary is aware that she has recovered and has somewhat regained control of her movements. Maybe treating her as if she's still a patient is not appropriate anymore. After Regere has expressed her desires, the apothecary has to think if he should accept it so easily. He is aware that she has made progress with her recovery, but is she doing this just to return the favor? He doesn't want her to feel like she owes him anything for the treatment, so he makes up his mind and begins telling her that it would have been easy for him to agree to her request if her body had recovered completely. The elf knows that she can't use her magic or limbs that well yet, and he can't give her work when she is half sick. He has to apologize to her for turning her down like this, but it had to be done. He promises her that he'll make sure she is able to work someday, and he will definitely let her work with him when that time comes. She decides that she will improve health-wise and in other departments as well, so she isn't as useless anymore. After this, she has a drastic change in her attitude and starts doing as many things as she can without his help. Thank God for her right arm that still works. 
Even though he doesn't want her to force herself, he knows that she has become unstoppable now. He still manages to help her with potentially dangerous activities. However, she has stopped asking him for any sort of help completely. She has a determined look on her face while she searches for things she can do all the time. For instance, she even imagines mana flowing from her fingertip into the flower, so she is even practicing to get her magic back forever. Four months pass by, and the apothecary is in his shop trying to work on the next recording stone delivery for the merchant when he hears Regere's voice. She has prepared the breakfast, and is obviously not happy to find out that the apothecary hasn't slept the whole night again. Looks like she has got the hang of using her limbs in three months, and she is walking around the place with a crutch. She got ready to work in such a short time, so he let her help out in the workshop like he promised. At night, the apothecary thanks her for helping him out. She really is a hard worker. This is a huge compliment coming from him, and it makes Regere happy. Now, she can finally fall asleep peacefully. The apothecary knows that helping a single elf girl isn't going to erase his past mistakes, but she needed help and he wanted to help, so here they are. But now, she has made an amazing recovery, and is even helping him with his work, and that ragged elf is lost in a distant memory. She is able to move around decently now, but he feels like she needs artificial limbs for her own safety. Thankfully, those recording songs with her singing have become quite popular, and selling them has made them enough money to afford those artificial limbs. They have to travel again, but this time, they won't come across the King Grizzly since they have the air gal. They travel for four and a half days, and finally arrive at the Dorvan city of Volston, which is known for its metalworking. The apothecary has an old friend living here who hasn't replied to his letter, which makes him worried, but he still decides to head over to the forge. He is relieved to find the blacksmith Madrilli at the forge, but asking her to make the limbs is a challenge like no other. She hates elves, and is the only person who can get the job done. He has to spend the next few days trying to convince her. When Madrilli sees Regere walking around and talking to everybody about Dorvan technology with a childlike wonder and curiosity, she ends up warming up to her. Since the artificial limbs need strong power sources, they end up repurposing the Air Gal's engine to assist them in this regard and they succeed at it. Madrilli's craftsmanship is truly perfect, and the limbs are too good for daily life, so he can hardly complain. They decide to leave Volston after a few days of adjustment, as their money is all gone now. They leave the Air Gal with Madrilli and use a portal to get back. He has no complaints about being penniless after watching Regere finally being able to walk properly next to him. On their way back home, the apothecary overheard someone talking about the recording stones they have been selling. Are they famous already? This person isn't just talking about how wonderful these stones are, but is also spreading the rumor that they come from a priestess in the east, who has all the power to subdue animals and magical beasts. The apothecary can't stop thinking about what he heard, even after reaching back home to the workshop. He doesn't want these rumors to cause a huge problem for him and Regere, and thinks that he probably shouldn't give the next batch of stones to the merchant right now. However, his thoughts are interrupted by an elf who shows up at the workshop. This is clearly not a friendly visit, but an attack. The elf's bloodlust was too strong to be ignored by him, but he managed to overpower her. Regere rushes over to them as soon as she hears him interrogating her, but this is when the other elf's animosity vanishes into thin air, which makes him loosen his grip to release her. The intruder is now in tears. She runs to Regere and hugs her. It turns out that they both are sisters, and the intruder's name is Adaria, who has been searching for her sister since she disappeared from their village years ago. Adaria and the apothecary apologize to each other for acting like children a few seconds ago, and they sit down to talk. Adaria reveals to Regere that she is from a tribe of proud forest-serving Bowyers, and her real name is Lumeria Shira Ausplum. Will hearing her real name bring back memories? After this, Adaria says that she is tasked with arresting the criminal who put a secret elven technique into stones and shared it with the humans. However, Regere still hasn't recollected her past, sadly, and reveals to Adaria that she is the one who has spread the secret technique of the elves unknowingly. Adaria, on the other hand, has a deeply pained expression on her face while she tells Regere that she will have to bring her back for trial for disclosing the elven secret. The apothecary can't let her take all the blame, and volunteers to go with them to give his testimony in the trial, since he's responsible for leaking the secret. Adaria tells him that he can come, but outsiders aren't allowed to leave once they enter the village. The apothecary is a little confused, but he made a promise to cure Regere, and he isn't about to release a patient prematurely. He decides that he is coming with them, since he can't let anyone hurt Regere unfairly, even if it means putting himself at risk. 
Regere is obviously very touched by his kindness, and they plan to leave the next morning with Adaria. The morning arrives, and Regere is a little sad, as she isn't sure if they'll be able to return back here. She will surely miss this place she had started to call home. Adaria has shown up with their means of transport, and it turns out that they will be flying to the village on the back of an unusually large griffin. Elves consider this normal, obviously. The griffin's name is Grim, and he surely looks like a strong bird. Grim doesn't mind having three adults and their luggage on his back, and starts soaring through the air. At this point, they aren't aware that there is someone else who has managed to track their location, thanks to the stones he has been selling. This person doesn't look like he will bring any good news for them, since he is interested to find out where those long ears live. Coming back to the trio, they headed west from the workshop and past the mountains. They find a place to camp until the next day, since Grim needs some rest as well. The next day, they reach a mountain with a hole in the middle, and Adaria exclaims that this is their home, Elsvaria. Grim also returns to his birdhouse, and the apothecary and Regere follow Adaria to the local police, where she has to report their arrival. The apothecary can feel the other elves staring at them curiously from every direction, until he spots one of them approaching the trio. It turns out that this new elf is Regere or Lumeria's mother, and they have an emotional mother-daughter reunion. Lumeria's mother's name is Ladmia, who is heartbroken to find out that her daughter has no memories of her home, but she seems to have realized the whole story after taking a closer look at her daughter's body. They take a detour to their house from the police station, as Ludmia wants to give them something. However, they are interrupted by someone's approaching footsteps, who have followed them to their house. This person is asking Adaria why she hasn't reported to the station, even though Grimm is back. The man's name is Shaknasama, and Adaria apologizes to him, and it looks like this man is her boss. He looks at the apothecary in Lumeria, and his face is quickly filled with scorn and hostility. The apothecary is glad that he came, since Lumeria could have definitely not handled this alone. Shaknasama is not pleased that Adaria has brought a filthy human, and he immediately sentences both of them to death. Adaria is shocked to hear this, since she never expected her sister to be murdered like this. The apothecary surrenders, as he believes that trying to escape will only put everyone's lives in danger. He has a few tricks up his sleeve anyway, but for now, he and Lumeria quietly accept their fate and they are brought to the police station. The duo is put in separate cells without questioning and Adaria is the one who has put the locks on their doors personally. A few days after they are imprisoned, some people with a deep hatred for elves attack their home. Shakna, the chief of police, is targeted first because of his past. Adaria releases the apothecary and Lumeria from prison. However, the leader of the attack is her old kidnapper. She regains her memories instantly after looking at his face, but passes out the next second. The apothecary is deeply injured, after fighting against the intruders as well. When Lumeria finally woke up, she awakened the High Elf magic dormant in her right arm, which helps her to restore the apothecary's mana, thus saving his life. Their crimes are excused for helping the elf community to deal with the attackers, and they are set free. Lumeria has also decided to leave her home with the apothecary, and her mother gives her a memento of her late father, an elf tear. This memento is the key ingredient for a high potion that Adam tells Lumeria about. However, they have to visit Adam again since this high potion requires special equipment and knowledge. If everything manages to go well, they can restore Lumeria's body to its initial stage, curing all of her internal damage. She drinks the high potion after it is finally prepared, and a large amount of energy expands within her body. It turns out that the potion has worked its magic, and she hugs the apothecary in her excitement. Lumeria requests the apothecary to call her Regere to remind her of everything he has done for her, and this is when the apothecary decides to tell her his actual feelings. He professes his love for her, and asks her to stay with him as his partner forever. She agrees by telling him that she is in love with him as well, and they kiss. Things get hectic for a while after this, until one day Adaria finds the noble who bought Regere from the kidnappers, hurt her a lot, and finally put a curse on her, and she makes sure that he gets an appropriate punishment. When Regere hears about this, she only says that she can finally forget now, and they can continue living their life with the apothecary going on occasional trips to gather medicines. Regere has also started to cure people with her healing magic. She has become so popular, their small village has turned into a full-blown town. The apothecary and his ragged elf have settled down with children of their own, spending the happiest times of their lives together, and bringing this very emotional and moving tale to an end. Well guys, that was quite the story. What did you think? What other mangas or manhwas would you like for us to cover? If you know of any like this one, please let us know in the comment section because we're always looking for new stuff. 
I hope you guys enjoyed the story of the Apothecary and the Ragged Elf. Thank you so much for sticking with us till the end. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for more, and consider checking out the other stories on our channel. Once again, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.